almost 50 hours of flight time and slightly under 9,000 nautical miles. Yes, the trip from New York all the way to Europe was truly an experience of a lifetime. November, as we learned to preface the plane in Europe, 2-4 Charlie Papa safely transported my wife Lois and I without any mechanical problems. Before we begin, the video professionals on our wide world of flying production crew want me to let you know that this is my home video you're about to see and not their usual superb broadcast quality job. Flying the plane was my first priority and videotaping came way down the list. But fortunately, in the pre-flight planning, I had equipped the plane with two permanently mounted cameras. So that's why you'll see the back of my neck much of the time. Once again, let me emphasize the importance of pre-flight planning. There wasn't anything I felt I wasted time on during the six months prior to the flight. As a matter of fact, I wish I'd spent more time to read every detail in the information section of the European JEP coverage that came from Frankfurt, Germany. Several of the real-life IFR procedural problems I encountered were all clearly stated in the fine print of the en route section. It's a trade-off between having the big trip kit come early so you can study it, or having it come later and be as current as possible. I found some inexpensive binders at the local stationery store to help me organize the nine volumes needed to hold all the charts. Labels made on a home computer help to keep track of where all this important information was during the trip. To make sure everything is working, there's no better way than to test it. Critical to overwater communications is an HF radio, so a temporary installation of this new ICOM marine unit was made in the aft baggage compartment. The control head, used up front, is connected by a thin fiber optic cable. One week prior to departure, I flew to Bangor, Maine. Aerofusion, run by Diane and Larry Mall, installs ferry tanks, plus rents and sells survival equipment. It's one-stop shopping for a trip like this and a popular northeast stop for ferry pilots. The various size tanks are fabricated right here, tested under pressure, and the process is certified by the FAA. It took about six hours for the installation on 2-4 Charlie Pop and cost around $1,300. Each airplane is different, with a pressurized model such as the 340 a little more difficult. The cross-feed fuel system drain valve is removed and a new fitting installed. This allows the cross-feed plumbing already in the wing to feed the ferry fuel into the aircraft main tanks. A small fitting in the wing route allows access to the cabin fuel tank. After the trip, when the system was removed, the ends of this fitting were capped and sealed to avoid pressurization problems. Dual electric fuel pumps are fabricated with a fuse system and switches. These are 25 gallon per hour pumps, allowing either one to operate the system. The custom-made 98-gallon tank provided me with slightly under three hours more flying time at 70% power. Add that to the aircraft's four hours, 45 minutes to dry time, and you can quickly understand why Barry Schiff and others claim that not carrying extra fuel over water was like the runway behind you on takeoff. With our small cabin class twin, we decided not to wear the survival suits Aerofusion sold us, but figured we'd don them in an emergency. What you're watching here is an in-flight demonstration of putting on the immersion suit. It was suggested that we try this once before we go any further. And then when this is all through, she's going out this window right here. Most single-engine pilots wear these uncomfortable suits at least up to the waist throughout the overwater portion of their flight. Not content to believe the instructions, Lois further decided to see if these suits truly would keep you afloat. The indoor swimming pool of the hotel near our home base airport provided a calm and peaceful substitute for the North Atlantic. Finally, departure day was here. The critical factor here is not whether they fit or not, but the critical factor is putting as much weight in the nose because of the overweight uh, of the fuel and everything else in other parts of the airplane. I 
think I will go outside now and try for a bigger bag. Listen, a couple of the guys around the airport were asking me why you were doing this. The ocean is there. The plane flies. You know, a couple of guys around the airport may be asking a good question. It's the way I feel about it today. <laughs> now, my hope is that all my wife's clothes can go in here. <laughs> Okay, now I want uh, 30 gallons. And Tower 4, Charlie Pops now with you, and you got the word, we're ready to go. Yep, I got the word. If you note frustration in my voice, it's because the Charlie. longest ATC delay of the 27-day trip, almost an hour, was at my home airport on departure. Twin Cessna 24, Charlie Pop, 24, Charlie Pop. Wind 300 at 8, clear for takeoff. So after almost six months of preparation, we were departing Caldwell, New Jersey, on an odyssey that my wife later dubbed an outward bound experience. From the Flight Safety International Procedures course, through flying the NDB DME approach to Narsarsawak, Greenland in a simulator, and in the actual airplane, I had prepared for the challenge and dream of crossing the North Atlantic in my own plane. And Lois, admitting to a fear of heights and water, and who could have sold her right seat to a dozen of our pilot friends was there beside me. Our first stop was back at Bangor to pick up a rental water-activated ELT and life raft from Aerofusion. And it gave me another chance to ask some questions that had come up relative to proper operation of the ferry fuel system. We decided to spend a night at Setil, Canada to avoid huge weekend overtime charges in Greenland. While we had been to Canada many times before, this town on the St. Lawrence River was delightful. Setil means seven islands, and there's much to do and see in this region. Landing and departure, IFR and VFR on runway 27. Be aware we have birds activity in the vicinity of the airport. Inform Setil on initial contact that you have received information, Juliet. Charlie Papa, taxi to the end, right on taxiway Alpha, contact ground 121 decimal 9. Or Charlie Pop. We have been constantly asked how much bother and time the customs and immigration was in Europe. Well, Canada and the return to the United States were the most troublesome, and they weren't even that bad. This little town in Canada is so French that we found more people speaking English when we got to France itself. November 2 4, Charlie Pop, clear for takeoff, runway 27. 4, Charlie Pop, clear deal. U.S. Bay, here we come. Michael Tell's here. Gas, Michael Tell's here. Carriage, make right, sure sir, you're probably one mile west of the button of uh, 1-6, descending to 1.5. I'd like to do a, a landing on the button of 1-6 if it's convenient for you. And uh, we'll just be there for about half a minute and lifting off again. Uh, Mike Hotel's here. The uh, runway is closed. I have vehicles on it. You can land beside the button if you wish. Yeah, that would work just fine. Thanks. Mike Hotel's here. Roger the wind 030-1015. Goose Bay, Labrador was our stop on Sunday evening. It's an active military base with several countries using it for training on a year-round basis. 
Since the first overwater leg of our Atlantic adventure was coming up in the morning, I transferred the immersion suits, life raft, and survival equipment into the cabin, hoping they wouldn't be needed. Being a military field, the security is tight here, but the service is friendly, and there's an excellent Canadian weather office. The Lab Inn, as the locals call it, was our home for the night. It's a renovated World War II barracks, but comfortable and with a good restaurant. And for Charlie Pop is ready to go on 2-6. Uh, we'd also like you, if you could, we'll try to look at the markers. Uh, give us a time that we break the gr distance we break the ground, since we have never taken off with this much of a load before. 2-4, Charlie Pop, Tara Roger. Both cables are down. The wind's calm, clear to take off from way 26 in the air contact terminal, 119 decimal 5. And I'll give you that uh, distance before you switch. Thank you very much, 4 Charlie Pop. Well, this was it. My first takeoff at 800 pounds over gross fully loaded with fuel and using the 12,000-foot runway at Goose Bay as my laboratory. This experiment would prove very important since the weather at our next planned stop in Greenland was below minimums. Therefore, we filed to a small 3,000-foot strip further up the west coast of Greenland. Knowing we'd have to take off there in the same overgross condition made this experiment very important. You did it. November 2, Fort Charlie Papa, that was 3,000. Thank you very much, sir. Appreciate it. Landing gear? Is up. Yaw damper? Is on. The fuel flows? Are good. Engine instruments? Are terrific. I don't believe it. The what? performance. We're doing 1,500 feet a minute. Full. In a full power climb and less than max climb speed, and no wind virtually. Ferry pilot Bill Cox told me it would be like this. Bill, you were right. Women to Fort Charlie Pop, Tower contact departure 119.5. 119.5, thanks a lot for the help, good day. Well, that was our first big hurdle. Getting off, right? Yeah. No problem, huh? Not at all. You proud of her? Yeah. Well, this gives us a lot of options with that kind of takeoff distance. A lot of options. We're underway, Babel. Yep. We got out of Goose. We're passing through 5,000 feet. The plane is at uh, top of the green arc for climb power. There's nothing wrong with that. Temperatures are running good. We're at 125 knots. And we're climbing at 1,000 feet a minute. The plane is essentially uh, 800 pounds over gross. Caution is not to try this on one engine. Nearing the edge of VHF comm radio reception, it was time to establish contact by HF. The ICOM M800 lightweight control unit sure was handy. Remember, the electronics are all out of the way in the rear of the airplane. A conventional HF receiver would have occupied the co-pilot seat, a familiar sight in planes being flown by ferry pilots. Gander, Twin Cessna 24, Charlie Pop. Radio check on eight. By calling Gander, stand by, please. I guess he heard us. Standing by for Gander, go ahead now. Roger, here's Twin Cessna 2-4, Charlie Pop. Radio check, please. We're uh, giving this as our primary frequency from Moncton. Okay, confirm your November 2-4, Charlie Papa. Diagonal. That's affirmative, sir. Okay, I'm reading you loud and clear. Later, it was time for a full position report, just like we learned during IFR training. 2-4, Charlie Pop is uh, crossing 60-40 north, 55 west, at 1556. We're estimating 62 north, 5350 west, at 1625. Then the destination, Gatab, is next. We're at flight level 210. Four Charlie Pop. Four Charlie Pop, Gander, roger your position. Next call on this frequency. 
And Gander 24 Charlie Pop, you're just uh, readable barely now on this frequency. 24 Charlie Pop again, I have it okay. Call me again at uh, 62 North on uh, 11336. Gander. 11336, thank you. 4 Charlie Pop. Well, it's been a while since we've used a uh, regular VHF radio, but here we are now finally talking to Julian Ob Radio on our way to Gatab on 123, uh, 213. The uh, Gander HF turned us over to this frequency. We're still at flight level 190, and in about five minutes we'll begin a descent. As you can see, we're about uh, 86 miles out of Gatab and uh, 28, 29 minutes out. The Loran has been holding up very, very nicely for an area in which there is supposed to be absolutely no good Loran coverage. And looking at the radar in the ground mapping mode, it appears that we're looking at some landfall there, uh, a little uh, island that sort of juts out. And so uh, we're headed home towards our first destination over water. And the really probably uh, most uh, critical stage of the flight for people who've never done it before. Four hours into the flight, our first sighting of land and contact with Gotthob Greenland APHIS, similar to our Unicom. November 24, Charlie Papa, APHIS. Go ahead. Cessna Titian, call sign Glaze 896, this time lining up on way 24 for departure. Off the right wing, you can see the weather to the south, which we avoided by using Gothaub for our Greenland stop. The only word to describe the scenery here is spectacular. Four Charlie Pop is turning base. November 4, Charlie Pop, no traffic on the runway. Wind is 290 degrees, magnetic 6 knots. This is a little fishing village about 250 nautical miles up from the southern tip of Greenland. 3,000 feet of asphalt never looked so good to two people than it did here. The only thing that kept running through my mind during approach was the need to get out of here after filling all the tanks with $8 a gallon fuel. That would mean another 800 pound overgross takeoff, but this time it was no experiment. I want to November 4, Charlie Pop on count 15. Or Charlie Pop. There is no such thing as a quick turnaround at Gothaw. Eskimos with little knowledge of English top your tanks with a slow fuel pump. And an airport manager took almost $1,000 US cash from us for the fuel and landing fees. However, we met up with a ferry pilot flying a Cessna 172 from Wichita to Belgium. We agreed to keep in radio contact over the desolate Greenland ice cap if we made it off the runway with our load. And 4 Charlie Pop is departing on runway 6. November 4, Charlie Papa, wind is 350 magnetic, 9 knots. Roger, traffic on the runway is November 4, Charlie Papa. We got it. We do. Oh. All right. November 4, Charlie Papa, Lugay, Fisher, Airborne 41. With the takeoff behind us and an over four hour flight to Reykjavik, Iceland ahead, we tuned to 123.45 to talk to our new friend. And uh, Dana Charlie Alpha, just like at the end of the last fjord, so it looks like more or less this, the wind is pretty good the way it is. That's encouraging. That's very encouraging. The clouds seem to pretty much uh, stop right at the end of the fjord when they come up to the ice cap. Nice to have him out there in front yeah. of us. Nice to have you out there in front of us. Won't be long, you'll be passing pretty soon. Monitoring the same frequency brought a helpful suggestion from Greenland Air, the state commuter airline. Uh, you are 
one, two, three, four, five. Greenland Air, two, six, six, calling uh, November two, four, Charlie Papa. Yeah, Greenland Air, two, four, Charlie Pops on uh, one, twenty, three, four, five. Uh, for your information, you can tune in uh, two, zero, seven kilocycles. This is uh, Iceland uh, broadcasting, and it should go uh, the range all the way over here. Well, thank you very much. That sounds exciting. 2.07 for Iceland Broadcasting. Uh, it's located close to Reykjavik Airport. After losing radio contact with both planes, we found the ADF our primary means of navigation until reaching the eastern edge of Greenland. I'd say this is the hardest part of the trip is over. Oh, going, yeah. And this part. The part down there, you got islands in the middle, the Loran works the whole way. You're not in hostile territory, except for water. And I mean, we really had a lot of things to get accustomed to. The problems that happen on this flight, we have never had before. No, that's what, that's what the whole flight's about. You don't have, that's why. It's so horrible. A bit of an adventure. Wow, bit, I would say a bit. And approach for Charlie Pop. Uh, are you on uh, Greenwich time, uh, or what's the plus or minus? Affirmative, we are on uh, Greenwich uh, time. So right now. So they're right now on. So local time is now 2246, same as Greenwich mean time. So it's 1046 here. <laughs> <laughs> Four Charlie Pop is clear to land. We had been flying for more than eight hours this day across two big stretches of water. Yet the sunlight outside at night illuminated our first real look at an urban area since departing the United States. Reykjavik is an undiscovered gem in the North Atlantic. As the capital of Iceland, it is the largest city with a population of 90,000 of the friendliest people. The entire country contains only a quarter million people in a crisp, clean environment and a real use of general aviation to transition the beautiful countryside. Are you familiar with the airport? No, we're unfamiliar with the airport. We're going to customs, I guess. They will come to you. Okay, you turn off the runway to the right shortly and the uh, taxi behind the uh, military transal and you can pack alongside the uh, only which is on, uh, located on the runway. You'll probably see it shortly. Yeah, we got it. Taxi next to Moody. Thank you very much. 412. Okay. How did we do? 1309.7. Oh, look where the hotel is. Yeah. <laughs> Made it, kiddo. The Loft Leader Hotel is a pilot's dream. Ask for a room on the airport side and you're in full view of the ramp. Good food and a 22% pilot discount on rooms make high-priced Iceland manageable for those who stop here. This is an ideal summer vacation spot, even if you have to take the airliner. Wanting to learn as much as I could, I had a real decision in whether or not to use a flight planning service. It was the leader of Flight Safety's International Procedures course who convinced me that it would be a good learning experience and introduced me to a newer service that will accept light planes. It's called Base Ops International in Houston, Texas. Now it turns out this was an excellent choice. While you could do it on your own, and some legs I did, it's really nice to know that someone is tracking your every move. There's an 800 number you can leave with family and at the office. Plus, without any formal itinerary, this is a solid way to stay in touch. Now, Base Ops arranged handling. That's sort of a paid FBO that usually saves you time, trouble, and at least the money they charge by obtaining discount hotel rooms, free transportation, telling you where the best meals are in town, and the like. Probably the best service, however, is the availability of weather information. If you have no access to a MET station, 
but your hotel has a telex, or better yet, a fax machine, then weather is in your hand at the appointed time provided by base ops. This saved me more than once, and it's impressive to be called Captain Boyer. Base Ops even provided the service allowing a phone call to my daughter and her husband in Chicago while we were en route from France to Ireland at 10,000 feet. Hi there, we're calling you from the air. How are you doing? Doing fine. We are uh, on our way to Dublin, Ireland. We'll be there in about one hour and 15 minutes. and We've just spent the weekend with Uncle Joseph. Over. That sounds like fun. Over. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting the hang of it. Very good. How are you guys? We're all doing fine. Over. I'm glad to hear from you. Over. After three great days in Iceland, we set off early in the morning on our final leg to Europe. Destination, Glasgow, Scotland. You call me 4675. Call 4675. You're coming in at a broken on this frequency. 4675 for Charlie Pump. There's a good example where VHF does not work. So oh. we go to the HF. Iceland Radio, Twin Cessna 24, Charlie Pop. Position? 24, Charlie Pop, Iceland Court. Roger 4, Charlie Pop has passed 61 North, 1234 West at 1127. Estimate 60 North, 10 West at 1155. 58, 30 North, 8 West next. We're at flight level 150 and uh, we have a pilot report. The temperature is minus 10. The wind is 23 degrees true at 22 knots. Over. November 2, 4, Charlie Pop, Iceland Radio. 6, 1 North, 1, 2, 3, 4 West, 1, 1, 2, 7. And Federal 1, 5, 0. 6, 0 North, 1, 0 West. Sammy, it's German Air Force 053. Good afternoon, Rubber 310. Minus 10, zero, with 023 through diagonal 22 Iceland. That's affirmative Iceland for Charlie Pop out. Well, I really thought that uh, it'd be a bit more dramatic when we finally saw the uh, first landfall of Europe. As you can see from the King Loran, we're uh, 20 miles from Stornoway, Scotland. And we should be arriving there in just about five minutes. And then it's on 171 miles to Glasgow, but we figure we have it made once we make Stornoway. It's uh, pretty much land all the rest of the way. Unfortunately, as you can see from the uh, outside, we're about to enter the clouds here, and we can uh, just barely see land through the clouds, so the best indication that we're close to anything is looking at the radar and being able to tell that there's an island straight in front of us, and then it looks like uh, landfall to the right. Charlie Plamper, thank you. Report the outer marker for zero 05. The wind is 100, one 13 knots. The runway wet. Four Charlie Pop. Okay, approach. Approach, seat, belt, and harness. Got it. Landing lights. Check. Prop sink. Off. Jaw damper. Check. Wing flap. Air set. Landing gear. Is down. Pressurization. Is set. Complete. And four Charlie Pops at the marker. November 2 for Charlie Papa, you're clear to land runway 05. 1008 knots. Clear to land on five, thank you. Well, not a nice welcoming to Europe. Right? Well, well I guess we want to turn off as soon as you can. Well, in which direction? Right, I guess, huh? Right. 
So a rainy and gloomy afternoon greeted us at our first stop in Europe, but in no way dampened our adventuresome spirit. Glasgow, Scotland, our rainy and wet entry point to the continent, provided the starting point for a wonderful two and a half week private flying odyssey in Europe. Like clearance to Cranfield. Number two for Charlie Papa, Roger. Clearance will be a Dean Cross for Alpha departure. Report ready for taxi. First stop, Cranfield, England a small town located about 65 miles west of London. Surface wind is 28 to 0 degrees at 1103. 29.6. .6. And what better reason for a pilot to pick this spot than an air show, much to the dismay of my wife. But not just any air show, this is the European equivalent of our Oshkosh. Don't worry, I told Lois, it won't be bad since we're coming a day early. Traffic control was an unofficial advisory service with a continuous taped ATIS message. To your left. There's another one, Phil. Where are these guys coming from? 26 left hand, QFE 1003. Thanks, Elliot, 26 left hand. I think they're going to the other runway. Well, ask me if we're cleared. Yeah, they're not clearing. Where are they now? You got them? Yeah, one, two, and three. I think they're over there, too. I don't know what about this guy. See him turning back, back around? And then this red one in front of you, don't hit him. Where is he? Right over here. Okay. See him? You got him? Got him. Now see this little one down here? Yeah, got him. Down below you? Turn, right. make it circles. All right. I lost the red one. Princess uh, 24 Charlie Papa, you have uh, two ahead of you at the moment. Continue. Oh, jeez. Okay, we're not going to make it. We'll go around. The worst than Oshkosh. S turns on the second try helped us follow a long ease which didn't exit the runway. Boggy's on the runway, roll it well down the runway, please. You have a twin short behind him. Turn right down runway 18. Long ease on the runway, turn right down runway 18. That's not the black top one, the next one. Turn the wrong place. Yes, sir. undercarriage, mixture prop. Princess and Charlie Papa, uh, land 26. Or Charlie Papa, thank you. Uh, November 252, Baba, we're on finals now, but can't see the red ones. <laughs> <laughs> what a fiasco! In spite of quite cold, windy, and rainy weather, the next day turned out even busier. Pilots flew all sorts of aircraft into this event, held by the Popular Flying Association, much like the EAA. The ramp was full of home builds and old RAF warbirds, along with a great number of Pipers and Cessnas, a familiar sight to someone from the United States. Approximately 800 planes and more than 5,000 people populated this little town and set up their own airport community. After talking with several people who camped out in the damp and cold UK weather, I'll never again complain about the hot summer days in Oshkosh. And just like our shows of this type, there were the traditional booths displaying handhelds, jackets, intercoms, headsets, books, and the like. Plenty of places for pilots to spend money, and I did. At one of the bookstores, I bought a volume titled Flying VFR in Europe. As you'll see later in this tape, it pointed us to a delightful place in Bavaria. After two nights and three days, it was off to Amsterdam, a trip that taught me about airway slot reservations. Redfa is an IFR departure gate from England to the east. Passing into Amsterdam Airspace through Redfa. 
Uh, we were told we didn't need one, but uh, uh, our flight planning service, I'm sure, did if it was needed, although they just told us this morning we didn't need one. Roger, if you're, not, if you're routing in outside of controlled airspace, then you wouldn't require a slot, but at site for 110, you'll be inside controlled airspace and definitely wouldn't need one. Well, we don't have one. What's the altitude that I uh, don't need one? 5,000 Okay, we could accept that if that helps you out at all. Or oh. Charlie Pops on left base for 2-2. Two -two. For Charlie Pops, you are clear to land on 2-2, two -two and the indicated wind is 260 at 170. Or Charlie Pops, thanks a lot. For this historic city in Holland, we landed at Schiphol Airport, well laid out for both airline and general aviation operations. GA has its own separate runway, ILS approach, and terminal building. Almost all the people speak English and are helpful and very friendly. November 2-4, Charlie Papa, cleared for takeoff runway 22 two, with an immediate left turn heading 180. Say again, 180. Or Charlie Pop, immediate left to 180, and we're cleared to go. Two nights in the Netherlands, and we were off to Venice, Italy, where we had to land at Treviso, the military field, since Venice Airport was notumed out of service to non-scheduled flights. One of the things we have not really had on this trip is uh, beautiful VFR weather. But at this point, we are at 19,000 feet, currently looking down at the Swiss Alps. We're talking to, uh, you can hear in the background, Zurich Control. This is about the best I can do as far as getting any pictures of mountains. The problem has been a line of thunderstorms, which has kept us up high here. Uh, but it looks like we're headed to much better weather on the other side of, uh, of these mountains. While English is the international language of aviation, listening to the Treviso approach controller, there was no question what country we were in. November 24, Charlie Papa, identify 10 miles west of Vicenza VOR, descend to 5,000 feet on 1012, transition level 75. Okay, down to uh, 5,000 and 1012, we've got it. It took a regular cab and a water taxi to get us from the landing airfield into central Venice. Or to put it in more understandable terms, the transportation cost us $150 each way from the airport to town. Relating the three days we spent in Venice to the $100 hamburger, you might call this the $3,000 pizza. We did all the touristy things, but with the trip home still ahead of us, we didn't let this creature cross our path. From Venice, where we couldn't buy Avgas, to Salzburg, Austria. On this particular trip, the Alps are a little bit more present than they were on the last trip. We're at uh, 16,000 feet, and we're getting a real good look at, at what we passed over going the other direction while we are above the clouds. This is an excellent example of uh, flying on airways using OD only ADFs. This. Uh, where my finger is, is off of a VOR. As a matter of fact, it's Vincenzo VOR. But this is an ADF station. And this leg of the airway goes from Balzano ADF to Innsbruck ADF. And then we pick up a VOR radio from there. Probably the reason for that is that the uh, nav drops out with these mountains here, leaving the ADF as the uh, primary uh, means of navigation. Four Charlie Pop, about to right, one three zero, and heading one three zero, three zero, circling approach on three three four. Four Charlie Pop, uh, one three zero, on heading, and we're cleared for circling three four. I just up to another. No one should get the idea this long a trip is one big vacation. There was a limit to how long we could bury each other in the cockpit of a small plane. So in Salzburg, domestic duty called for doing the laundry. We had left a week open to just explore, picking our first stop from a description in that book we bought at the Cranfield Air Show. For Charlie Papa, Filshofen, uh, runway news 1-2, direct approach, report final. For Charlie Papa. Edge is 1020. Oh, that's pretty cool. That's good. See it? Right yeah. on the river? It was our first VFR flight in just 40 minutes to Vilshofen, Germany, a town of 5,000 people with a 3,000-foot strip right on the Danube River. Charlie Pop is on final. Pop, wind 
Charlie Nuts. Or Charlie Pop. Our home video doesn't do this site justice. A well-maintained strip in the heart of Bavaria, near the Austrian border. Alongside runs the famous Danube River. We got this at the Cranfield Air Show. Airfield staff and club members are friendly and tend to make visitors welcome. Helping fix accommodation, car hire, or whatever you need. <laughs> so we took a chance. The German government pays this couple to man the customs office and operate the Unicom type tower. The airport is a general aviation dream. An active aero club, charter and sightseeing flights, plus a maintenance shop keep it bustling with activity all week long. I'd read about a turntable type hangar, but this is the first one that I'd ever seen. As the book described, everyone was most helpful in finding us a rental car and arranging for a hotel room. All of this without any advance notice. And before long, we joined the airport restaurant gang in eating and watching the airport activity. On our first night, we were invited to join about a dozen Aero Club members at the local beer garden. Flugplatz means airport, and our new German friends told us about an annual air show just a 45-minute drive from Vilsofen near the Czech border. Here on a 1,500-foot grass strip with hills at both ends, the local townspeople come out each year to enjoy a summer day at this event. There are sightseeing rides, a German band, beer, good food, and yes, a small air show. That's me, helmet and goggles, in the front seat of a 1946 French Stomp. What a real thrill to just be in this setting, let alone participate in riding a biplane at 60 knots over this gorgeous countryside. The three nights and almost four days came to an end much too quickly here in Bavaria, but we sadly said goodbye to all our new friends. There should be no question that this unplanned stop on our trip ranks among the best of our European experiences. We hope we can repay the hospitality to those visiting the U.S. From Germany, it was on to Geneva, Switzerland. Through the haze, you can see the lake which dominates this very international region with a heavy French-speaking population. And do you want four Charlie Pop to the tower? Uh, AFM 1187, please. Four Charlie Pop is with you, short final for runway 23. Under four Charlie Pop, the wind is uh, nearly calm. We have a DC-9 under roll for departure, clear to land. Four Charlie Pop, we're cleared to land. See, they have a parallel grass runway here. To this big, long 12,000 foot strip. One day and one night in Switzerland, to complete our no reservations unplanned week, we decided on Bordeaux and to visit the famous wine country of France. Sur Romeo Kilo, qui zone et fréquence, au revoir. Merci. La Mike 61, vous affichez 70021. La Mike 101, vous affichez 70020. 70020-101. Québec Oscar. Québec Oscar. Québec Oscar, la patrouille d'Alouette 2, on passe euh, le point whisky 500 pieds pour Souge. Sur rappel en finale sur Souche, Québec Oscar, Mérignac, le vent est du 050 pour 12 nœuds. Nous rappel, Alpha Leader, de Vimbleur, tout fort, Charlie Papa, contact du point 1 to 1, décimal 9. Pour Charlie Papa. When asked about understanding controllers in Europe, that landing at Bordeaux probably best describes listening carefully for instructions in English with a heavy French accent. As you can see, without any pre-planning, we stayed in the heart of Bordeaux, rented a car for a trip the following day to Saint-Emilion. 
until this trip, Saint Emilion was only a label on a fine bottle of wine. But this day it became a lasting memory as part of the French countryside in a region noted for its vineyards. We received great pleasure at lunch in a small cafe, ordering two glasses of the House Red, which were fine Saint Emilion wine. Twenty-four hours later, we were drinking Evian water on a short VFR flight to Agen, France. This was the closest airport to the only living relatives from my father's family and a young pilot friend I had met on a previous visit. Philippe was a pilot, and when I met him at Agen Airport several years ago on a trip by airliner, I told him my next visit would be in my own plane. His family owns a 210, and he has corresponded with me over the years about parts, avionics, and upgrading. For many years, France has had a very sophisticated in-home video tech system that serves many functions, and in aviation allows filing flight plans. Philippe filed a flight plan for my trip the next day to Nantes, France, and then on to Dublin, Ireland. Which brings me to the subject of weather. The prog chart in the daily paper provides the easiest and best method for getting the big picture. Even if you don't read the language, it doesn't take long to figure out what's a high and low pressure area. However, there are many well-equipped MET stations, as they are called, throughout Europe. And the English-speaking weather briefers are equipped with the same tools as in the U.S. I found in-person briefing far more understandable than by telephone because of the many graphics. Ajan Tower, the twin Cessna, November 24, Charlie Pampa, departing runway 30. Waving our wings on departure to my uncle, aunt, cousins, and Philippe and his family, we were back on our pre planned schedule and departed for a refueling and custom stop at Nantes, France. We had absolutely no custom or immigration problems throughout Europe, and the U.S. Canadian border was worse than any other place. Okay, straight to uh, Delta, India, November, Squawk 3275, and flight level 100. Correct. Clear to take off, runway 21. Right. Landing lights. Right on after takeoff. For Charlie Papa. Transponder. Then our final European destination, Dublin, Ireland. This is Dublin information, Juliet, time 1400, runway news 10, radar positioning for visual approach, transition level, flight level 60, weather surface wind is from 0, 8 to 0 degrees, magnetic 10 knots, visibility 10 kilometers in haze, cloud 1 up to 2100 feet, temperature 19er, 2.13, QNH 1026 hectopascals, and the trend did not sink. Well, it had to happen, and at our last stop. After refueling with almost 280 gallons for the departure across the pond to Reykjavik, Iceland, it turns out all the cash I had ready to pay for the fuel was British, not Irish, pound sterling. Number 24, Charlie Pop is cleared from uh, Dublin to Reykjavik via airway Bravo 2, Donkey, flight level 100. Reach flight level 100 by donkey, and then it'll be oceanic from Denwick. Uh, or Charlie Pump. Don't forget to have me call base ops. Okay, when? When we get in the air, about 15 minutes in. 17 degrees centigrade on the takeoff, which is the warmest. The warmest? We've ever been. And after visiting nine European countries, we were off Dublin for the return flight home. First stop, Iceland. Tower Twin Cessna 24 Charlie Pop is ready uh, for takeoff. Now, I'm too much Charlie Papa, thank you, Tower. Line up the motor with 20. I have a message for you from the flight service if you're ready. Go ahead. Uh, the message is that the PTR number in uh, Who's Bay is uh, 250707. 250707. Thank you very much for Charlie Papa, and we're taking the uh, runway in position and hold. Our flight planning service, Base Ops, had come through again, 
this time relaying a Goose Bay landing permit number through Reykjavik Tower. From Iceland, it was on to Narsarsawak at the most southern end of Greenland. And time to use the ferry fuel tank again with its unique fuel gauge. Get it out faster, it dries. I call that about eight inches. Good morning, Graham. We're currently at 26 nautical miles from the airport to the east for landing, please. Charlie Parker, the South Park, that is copied. Present wind is 300 magnetic, 4 knots. QH is 1015. Runway for landing will be 25. And please report 1 2 miles. It will report 1 2 miles, and the landing runway is 25. Yeah, I think the airport's over this ridge here. So, up to the left. Look at these tops of these things. They got little lakes on them. Wow. Oh. These mountains are made of ice? Yeah. What this is right down here, it looks like we'd land on this. Uh, NR Sarsawak Twin Cessna 24 Charlie Papa is 12 nautical miles to the east. 24 Charlie Papa, the Sarsawak Roger. Local traffic is. I've never done, seen anything like this of you. Uh -uh. Ah. Very few people ever will. As you can tell, we were slightly overwhelmed by the stark beauty of the fjords, the clear water with ice caps popping through, and the almost total lack of any buildings or population. Not to mention the sight of this 6,000-foot runway after over four hours of flying. A squeaker at Nars. There seems to be one sole purpose for Nars Arsawak for those of us who have flown the North Atlantic. It provides a much needed fuel stop between Canada and Iceland. Weather service is excellent, high resolution satellite maps, and a superb briefer who has been there for years. All the airport people were friendly, much more so than Gothob where we landed on the trip over. We never saw the Arctic Hotel, except from the air on departure, but understand it is quite basic, but adequate. Our final overwater leg, Narsarsawak back to Goose Bay, Canada. That's affirmative, sir. Position at 1618 is 5636 north, 55 west. Estimating loach at 1649. Goose is next, and we're at flight level 100. And we're requesting goose weather, if we could, please. Well, almost exactly as it was entering Europe, the radar tells the story. As we come back upon Canada, and about 160 nautical miles from Goose Bay, Canada. The radar shows at about 25 miles, about uh, 35 miles out, we've got uh, a landfall, which means we're back on the continent. And cutting through the haze, just barely, you may be able to make out what we can. Landfall.
creature it goes. An overnight stay at Goose Bay and we were on our way to Bangor, Maine. Here we turned in our rental equipment and Aerofusion removed the ferry fuel tank. We weren't all that sad about losing that big smelly aluminum box. After nearly 50 hours of flying and over 8,000 nautical miles, the next morning we departed for the New York City area, an almost two hour flight from Bangor. Essex County Airport at Caldwell, New Jersey looked small in comparison with some of the international destinations we had used on the trip, but it was a very welcome sight to two weary travelers. Nobody to meet us. God! <laughs> no one. Here we are alone. I know! Would we do it again? Perhaps someday. But right now, we're relaxing in the knowledge of having done it. Every moment of the trip was full of experiences, either as aviators or tourists. What's important is that with proper planning, it is quite doable, and most frequently in singles rather than our more conservative light twin. Now, whether it be a first solo, a private ticket, that instrument rating, an ATP, or a North Atlantic crossing, General Aviation provides the unique goals, and few people with other hobbies know our enormous highs from achieving them.